Welcome everyone. I'm Judy Clem with the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory. Um, we are delighted to have you here this evening for Get the Dirt, where we will be answering your garden questions and uh, we'll pepper in a few of our own as well. Uh, before we get started, I just want to share with you some background about the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory. Um, it's a great story. If you haven't heard it, maybe you have. Um, it was in the early 1970s that the Oak Park Conservatory fell into disrepair and was slated for demolition. And a group of concerned citizens successfully banded together to raise the funds to save it. And it was this informal support group that um, inspired community leaders to form and incorporate the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory back in 1986. So next year we will be celebrating our 35th anniversary, which will be Yay. quite exciting. And um, right now, um, you may be familiar with some of our programs. We offer a wide range of programs in volunteering, um, educational and recreational opportunities, tours and classes. And now we have ventured into virtual programming. So we welcome you all to our summer virtual program series. Um, the program, just a few notes here, we are recording. And um, we will ask everybody as we go through the program to please use the chat box to enter your questions and um, then we will open it up um, for each of our pan panelists. And um, we will keep you muted for um, the program um, on, on, unless we see that we have a small enough group where we can actually open it up and you can have dialogue with our speakers. So let's kind of roll with it. Um, so I am going to introduce our speakers. <clears throat> Um, let's see, we've got Sandy Lentz. I'm Up here. To spotlight her. So there's Sandy. Um, Sandy Lentz has been a gardener since childhood. Uh, she has been trained at um, the University of Illinois Master Gardener Program um, since 1999. Uh, just for those of you who are not familiar with the Master Gardener Program, it requires 10 hours of continuing education training annually and a minimum of 30 hours of volunteer activities. Sandy um, has served on the initial Oak Park Park District's Greening Advisory Committee and on the board of the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory and um, we had a term as president of our fine organization. And currently she is on her second term as an elected commissioner for, on the board of the Park District of Oak Park serving as president since 2019. So Sandy, we are honored and delighted to have you here with us. Thank you for joining us as one of our panelists tonight. Um, and then I'm gonna introduce Don. Hi, Don. Hello. Um, Don Necrocious. <laughs> is a long-standing member of the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory and a University of Illinois Master Gardener as well um, with a volunteer certification in composting. He teaches classes in backyard and worm composting, seed starting, vegetable gardening, and garden tool care. He planted his first garden in, on, on Valentine's Day in 1972 and has been in love with flowers and vegetable gardening ever since. Don, we are delighted to have you on our panel this evening. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna go find Patty. Uh, there she is. Okay, so <clears throat> for those Patty. Who, there she is. For those of you who don't know Patty Staley, she is the Director of Horticulture and Conservatory Operations for the Oak Park Conservatory. Patty has a Bachelor of Science in Plant and Soil Science with a specialization in horticulture and landscape archi architecture. Uh, Patty has been with the Park District for 10 years. 10 years we've been blessed to have Patty Staley as part of our team. So that is your um, panel for the evening. I'm gonna moderate and <clears throat> I'm gonna ask you to please use this chat box. I kind of said, welcome everyone. Question, I'm gonna type in questions go here. And um, I'm going to start us off, and I'll probably start with you, Sandy, um, but I'll ask the same question of each of our panelists because we really want to get a sense of maybe what's growing in your garden right now. Tell us what's happening, what's blooming, what's fading, maybe what edibles are happening. Um, so, Sandy, if you want to um, kick us off, will you just kind of share with us what's happening in your garden um, mm -hmm. at this moment? I have what has been referred to as a severely over-farmed suburban backyard. Uh, it's not terribly big, but I have a long uh, perennial border, which right now is full of flocks. In fact, too many. So I have some sort of native ones that I'm going to have to thin out. 
but the phlox are blooming. Um, those are the, the big ones. And then I have a couple of good sized areas that are devoted to native plants. And a couple of them are labeled plantus unknownus because I can't find the tag, <laughs> but big daisies and right now culver's root, which is now five feet tall and it has yep. these beautiful candles of white, tiny white flowers. It's and it gorgeous. is alive with, it's gorgeous. It's alive with bees. Um, I have two raised vegetable beds. Um, and last year, the friends in their plant sale had a marzanita tomato that was a hybrid of a hybrid and a heirloom. And it produced like crazy. So I found the seeds and I have two of those and they are already producing. I've had my first tomatoes off of there. Wow. Um, my peas are done. My lettuce hasn't bolted yet, which is really, it looks like it's about to. I Usually it's gone by now. And then I have blackberries on the fence and a couple of rose bushes and a big patch of shade things, many of which are natives. So just a, a lot of different kinds of things. I've tried to learn to do things in groups of three and to do sweeps <laughs> and it doesn't always work very well. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that sounds great. Okay, so um, we'll come back to you with some questions on Don, I'm gonna spotlight you. Could you answer the same question? Kind of give us a, a snapshot of what's happening in, in your garden, wherever you're gardening these days? Sure, uh, there's two gardens. One uh, at my uh, old home here in Oak Park that's occupied by my daughter right now. She, she lives there and has um, taken the garden to an extreme. Um, <laughs> I was there this afternoon and um, I'm six foot two and I was the shortest thing in the garden. Wow. <laughs> way, way up here, that's Margaret. Um, and I'll talk about hers a little bit. I spent a lot of time in Wisconsin. So, you know, my, my mind is about the, uh, the time I spent in a meadow a couple of days ago watching uh, monarchs chase fritillaries from uh, Monarda. Um, they were just finding the best things to sip on. Echinacea is uh, starting to bloom in mm -hmm. the meadow and also um, Rudbeckia, um, which is really neat. Uh, in fact, Margaret's got two kinds of Rudbeckia. We were talking about that this afternoon. Uh, typically for me right now would be uh, getting close to harvesting garlic. Um, we generally put in a, a three long hills about um, 40 feet long of garlic. So we get eight different varieties in. And wow. this is about the time when they, when they start, uh, the scapes have gone, we've eaten those and uh, things are drying out and starting to fall over. So we would lift those and uh, make sure not to wash them because if you wash them, you'll get mold on the, on the uh, papery shells of the, of the bulbs and hang them on some uh, trays that I built in a little building where they can get air but no sun. And then uh, that patch would be turned into buckwheat uh, for buckwheat. Uh, this time. Yeah, buckwheat uh, starts very, very quickly, easily. And um, we plow, I plow it under with a rototiller just as it starts to bloom. You don't want to let it go to seed. And okay. it does extraordinary things to the tilth of soil. The okay. soil is very light and, and alive. And uh, it, it, of course, it's a green manure, basically what we're doing. And then you start the whole process of, of planting garlic all over again. Um, wow, yeah. You know, zinnia, dahlia, uh, are in bloom, marigold, uh, and uh, lots of fun in the herb garden. Dill is not headed up yet. It's nice and frilly. Although I did taste some dill at my daughter's house. It was a rather strange flavor. And she told me that her children put on their sunscreen right next to that dill. So oh. <laughs> sunscreen. It doesn't enhance the flavor of dill. Um, <laughs> so, and kale, I think that's the other thing. I okay. <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't wait to come back and talk to you about garlic in a second. Um, okay, I'm going to switch to Patty because um, I'm dying to hear what's going on in <laughs> Patty Staley's garden. Are you going to tell us about your garden or are you going to tell us about the conservatory garden? No, I'm going to tell you about my garden because okay. evening is my time to enjoy my garden. Okay. Um, so actually right now I have my three chickens, which I just um, adopted this spring at my feet eating little sun gold tomatoes that we wow. grew the plant sale. So if you hear them, that's what you hear. They're, they're crying for more tomatoes. But wow. uh, that's kind of the exciting thing we have going in our garden this year. Um, I think with uh, quarantine, um, a lot of us decided to do things a little loopy, maybe try some things that we wanted to in life that we hadn't. And um, we've always wanted to raise chickens. So we have a few chickens. I kind of joke with, um, you know, my staff that when 
when you work in plants, you know, for your career and your life is plants, eventually you move on to either chickens or koi fish or goats. It seems like, you know, every gardener moves on to, okay, what else can I produce in my yard? So that's what we're doing. But um, some interesting things that are happening um, in our garden at home, um, and you might have seen the same stresses this year in your own home landscapes, are we lost two pretty large trees. Um, one, um, we are assuming is uh, the second year effect of those frigid, frigid cold temperatures we had back in winter of 2018. If you remember those days that we were told to stay home, what was it, the Arctic blast? Right. Um, so typically trees take a few years to show that effect. So we've seen a lot of dieback. We've lost um, one big maple in back. And then we lost a beautiful big leaf linden in front um, to the linden borer. So we just had those chopped down in the past few days. But besides that, um, if you haven't noticed, um, the days are starting to become shorter. And with that, a lot of your plants, your summer plants, are really starting to go full force into bloom. Um, your echinaceas, um, the, the late summer hydrangeas, and that's because it's, it's signifying the end of summer. They're preparing for winter, and that's why you have so many blooms this time of year, um, because the plants are preparing to go to sleep. So um, we're starting to do a little cutback of, you know, some of those late summer plants that, um, you know, like your nepeta and that have bloomed and they're done and they're tired and ready to go to sleep and things like that because we have um, about a half an acre and um, mm -hmm. I was fortunate, my husband and I were fortunate to um, purchase a home and inherit a home from a master gardener um, who oh. <laughs> spent her weekends um, going from plant nursery to plant nursery purchasing any and every plant she could. So uh, we have a lot of plants to take care of and we've kind of put our own twist on things here, but that's what's going on, on in my yard. Okay, that sounds like amazing. And are you gonna show us the chickens or? You know what, they've run away. I'm not sure where they've gone to. Okay. We'll see if they come back. When, when the chickens come back, be sure to show us. Um, yeah. I'm gonna continue, I don't see people putting their questions up, but I'm going to throw out, um, I've got a list of questions. Um, and by all means, I really want to hear from our um, community that's here tonight. But we certainly have, you know, a, a lot of people here that can um, chime in and answer any of your questions. So, um, Patty, while I've got you, um, could you please share with us some of the garden tools that you cannot live without? And I will ask all three panelists this question. So be prepared over there. <laughs> So um, I have a few, well, I have a lot of favorites because when you garden every day and it's your job, um, you want to have really good gardening tools. It's worth it to invest. Um, and so the first, um, my first favorite gardening tool, which I actually lost for about a year or two in our garage, um, is a pair of pruners. Now, I'm you know, I'm probably committing blasphemy here by saying I don't like Falco pruners, but I don't Ooh, like We'll Falco have to talk pruners. about that, Patty. Yeah, we will. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, but when I first started off, um, I don't know if you can see them. They're pretty, you know, worn out. But um, these are a pair of Barnell pruners I have. And I love these because I've had them for probably 18 years back when I was living in Peoria um, and working there. But they're nice um, for the ladies that don't like a heavy pruner. And they've uh, really just lasted me a long time. And I, they're my favorite pair. Okay. Um, my Amazing. other favorite gardening tool, um, and I actually grabbed a new one from our gift shop, um, is this sco soil scoop. Okay. And it's, you know, instead of, you know, digging your traditional way, um, to plant your annuals or bulbs or whatever, you scoop the soil like this. It has a nice soft handle. Um, it's a little easier um, if you suffer from carpal tunnel or arthritis. Um, my mother, who is 87 years old and still gardening every day, 
um, uses this. I buy her a new one every few years because she tends to lose them in her yard. Um, <laughs> so that's a great tool. I've got three more I'll show you quickly. Um, this is a favorite one of our crews. It's a soil knife. Okay. Uh, and I'll never forget um, the year that we brought um, landscape maintenance in house and we, we started doing um, the maintenance in the parks. I had our director of human resource call me and said, and said um, you know, hey, one of our staff people was driving around the parks and saw your staff with some knives. <laughs> <laughs> And I had to explain to her, no, that's actually a gardening tool. <laughs> yeah. But this is a great tool. Um, they use this a lot, like every day, whether it's planting, it has a serrated edge and another sharp edge. So you can cut back grasses or perennials with it. Um, so that's a good one. Soil knife. <clears throat> um, this is one actually, I just purchased this spring and I purchased some for a gift shop. Uh -huh. It's called a dibber. Uh -huh. And mm. um, I used it a lot this spring. It's an old English kind of tool um, to make um, holes for planting seeds directly in my vegetable gardens. And we used it actually um, when we were without all our volunteers back in, in March and February doing all the um, transplanting of the seedlings and the plugs. Okay, yes. Um, so one more tool. I know okay. I love tools. I okay. could talk forever about tools. Okay. Well, this is okay. good to know. This is great because we're. So this one yes. here, uh, I need to clean it. Uh, okay. This is a perennial spade. Now I don't have a particular favorite perennial spade. I've had a lot of different ones over the years. Um, you can't typically find them in like your local, you know, big box hard, you know, hardware stores. Um, you have to order them online, but it has a smaller um, a smaller um, blade to it for digging yeah. perennials in because okay. it gets really hard when you're planting perennials if you're using a typical spade. So a good perennial spade if you're a perennial gardener is a good one. Okay, that. that that is fantastic. So we know that you love your tools. I'm gonna um, switch over to um, Sandy. Um, because I think she's got some that she wants to share with us as well. And then um, Don, if you have tools that you want to mention, and then we'll go to the chat because we're getting some nice questions coming in. The infamous Falco <laughs> pruners. Okay. So Patty, what was the brand of your pruners? Somebody asked. Um, it's Barnell, B-A-R-N-E-L. I'm not sure. I've not bought a pair in a long time. It's a brand out of Switzerland. I'm not okay. sure if they're still in business or not. Okay, and, and Sa Sandy, which ones? You've got the Fel. These are our, our standard issue Felco. Uh, I've managed to lose at least one pair in spite of the orange handles. It turned up a year later in a perennial bed. Um, and I just had these uh, oiled and sharpened. And okay. I use them all the time, deadheading, okay. uh, trimming, um, and for my hands at least, they're very comfortable. These are the mm -hmm. kinds of things that uh, you have to, um, you learn to use something that works really well for you that might not work well for somebody else. Okay. But my all time, if I had to pick just one, it's this guy. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. This is the infamous dandelion digger. And it has, and mine's dirty too, uh, but it, the key part of it is that you get some leverage and there's this V-shaped end on it. This yes. is metal with a comfortable wooden handle. And it gets down underneath the weeds, down underneath the dandelions in that little V shape, and gets the, the weeds out, roots and all. And this is this is just this is just amazing. I even used it to transplant, trying to get a small plant out from under in a very crowded space. Yes. The final one is one of four of these, and I'll bet oh, Patty yeah. and Don mm -hmm. has these. These yep. are called tub trugs. They're plastic, they come in about five sizes. They have molded on handles. They are tough as nails. They will, you can put rocks and dirt and water and weeds and they're, they're, they're just amazing. The handles don't break. Uh, Gardener Supply has them in 15 colors and I've got four of them. I give them as gifts to people with houses. I gave one to our granddaughter when she moved into their house. And right. It's that called a tub, what, you, what is tub it? Trug, T-R-U-G. Okay. okay, got it. Uh, other places I have, have, I have them, I just got mine from there. 
Yeah, I have two of them and um, they're fantastic. I mean, I use it every single day along with that dandelion digger um, for mm -hmm. sure, essential tools. I love it. Okay, Don, do you want to share some of your favorites as well? Very quickly, uh, the garden knife that uh, Patty held up is an old fave from, of mine for lots and lots of reasons, weeding or um, dividing uh, perennials. Uh, mm. great. Um, a good hoe, actually I got, I got my favorite hoe from Goodwill. Um, I dropped up something off and there was that hoe sitting there, so I thought it'd be a fair trade. It's actually an old mason's hoe for mixing concrete, but it has a long handle. And a, a tool guy once taught me that long handled tools are American tools. Short handed tools, uh, short handled tools are made in Asia for shorter people. Uh, and I'm a tall guy, so to save my back, I need long handled tools. My, my daughter loves a uh, stirrup hoe. Uh, it it uh, wiggles back and forth and does a great job of weeding. Uh, getting at the roots below the surface. Um, the next thing is uh, really a two-part tool, my eyes and my mind. I think it's very mm. important to go into a garden every 10 days or so and just do a look-see. Look at the plants very carefully and ask yourself what's happening, what's flourishing, what's suffering. Ask yourself why uh, and, and move yourself towards integrated pest management rather than trying to use a chemical of any sort. And then finally, I know lots of people love the internet. I love the internet too. I, I honestly do, but it focuses on a single topic at a time. And I've, I have a need for being able to see the, the advance of the season. So I'm gonna hold up a tool here, uh, a book by mm. a Oak Parker, who is a master gardener, a garden journalist, Beth Botts. I'm afraid that it's, oh. everything is backwards. So you have to hold up a mirror to the screen <laughs> to, be able to read it forwards. But this is called Month by Month Gardening, Illinois, Indiana and Ohio what to do each month uh, to have a beautiful garden. And it's a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, I, I, I can't say enough good about it. So uh, if, if you like gardening books, uh, uh, please check mm. this out. And if you like gardening books, get to the library. They've got a very, very good extensive gardening shelf. So Excellent. Uh, one last one real quick, a gardening journal. I really think uh, oh. un unexamined life is not worth living. That says the same about a garden. Uh, we forget, uh, we, we fail to analyze the past season and fail to sit down and make plans or, or you know, write down problems or, or ask, you know, you've heard about a really neat plant, you want to grow it, you forget to write it down. So I, I uh, whenever I teach a gardening class, I make sure everybody goes away with a journal. So uh, I hope they use them out there. I have a page that says how tall it really got because uh, plant <laughs> tags and information <laughs> often says, oh, it's only, you know, 24 inches high. And the end of August, the thing is taller than I am. So I have found that to be really helpful, particularly in planning where things are going to go. Yeah, yeah, that's great. All mm -hmm. these are such great. This is exactly what I was hoping we would do with this evening. So folks, just, you know, make a lot of notes here. I'm trying to capture it in chat. We're recording. I'm going to start um, with the first question. And you don't all have to, all three answer it. But if one of you um, wants to build on what the other person said, that's great. Um, my grill produces a lot of ash. Is it okay to add that to my compost bin? I, let me jump in and grab that one real quick so I can get my answer. Yeah, compost, uh, Don. If, if these are charcoal briquettes that did not have a chemical in them, you know, there's self-lighting ones that have a, infused with a chemical, or you haven't used a chemical starter, which by the way is totally unnecessary. If you build a little volcano, a torus, and put crisscross twigs and light those twigs, they will light your charcoal briquettes. There's no need for the, those chemicals. If it's not chemical, you can put those ashes on your compost. Uh, compost is typically acidic. Ashes, of course, are basic um, and it's okay, but you wouldn't want to overdo it. Okay, great. All right, I'm gonna keep us going. Um, there's a question, and if I see duplicate questions, um, I will try to you know, make sure we cover um, all of them. Um, so we've got a question here about um, yellow leaves that are appearing on cucumbers, squash. Um, is there a fix for them? Should we remove them? Is there something that's causing this too much water? Or is it a mold? What, what kinds of things um, could be causing the yellowing? Because I'm getting that on my cucumbers too. What, what could be causing yellow leaves on cucumbers and squash? And is it a problem? Don, you're the veggie gardener. You want to take a pass at this? I think you should beat it to death with a shovel to tell you the truth. I <laughs> um, <laughs> but then I won't get cucumbers. <laughs> yeah, uh, you, you could have a serious problem of a borer 
a vine borer that will actually burrow into the vine and uh, begin to take the nutrients out of it. And you can tell that's happening by, again, examining the plant carefully. And okay. you can see a little hole about five times the size of a poppy seed and some frass, which is the chewed up little elements. And you can actually dig that borer out. You can cut that hole a little bit bigger, dig it out, and then wrap something around that hole and the plant will recover. It could also be a nutrient deficiency. Um, this is a chelation problem with not enough iron in the soil, so you want a well-balanced soil. Typically, the cucurbits uh, in general are heavy feeders, so uh, that's why they tell you uh, they also like a relatively fluffy soil for the roots. So that's okay. why they tell you to build a hill before you plant them, so they okay. have a nice mm -hmm. airy surface to grow on. And typically, it's good to, uh, you know, whatever the problem is, the answer is compost. You should have incorporated <laughs> compost into the hill, hill originally, and it'll okay. have been. Uh, uh, it will buffer disease and it will also uh, uh, give uh, nutrients as well as incorporate air and moisture. Great. So uh, I've, I'd like yeah, to pop ahead. in a little bit because I've seen a lot of these same questions. And folks have been having trouble when they have built their raised beds for vegetables of having soil that they've acquired not have enough nutrients in it. And right. some of that has come from the, the, uh, the soil that has been purchased some of it has come from, we remember we had a lot of rain early yeah. in the spring that washed a lot of nutrients out. Uh, I also swear by compost, but I also swear by fish emulsion. S smelly brown stuff that comes in a bottle. Um, and I dilute it some in the watering can and I put it on, uh, put it in my vegetables. My cucumbers, knock on wood, are doing fine and haven't turned yellow but uh, I have some things in pots and they don't have a lot of soil around them. So I use some of this dilute fish emulsion, both on, uh, on my vegetable beds every you know, three or four weeks, depending on what's going on. And Don walks his garden, he has two big gardens. I have a small one, I go out with my coffee in the morning and look at everything. Okay. And I don't have as much to look at, but I can't agree more. You wanna see what's going on, uh, oh, this just bloomed, or oh, I've got a deadhead that. Um, it's just, there's the infamous coffee cup, so. Yeah, um, so my natural instinct is to want to pull off those yellowing flowers just to kind of get them off, and then- Flowers or it, leaves? Or leaves, mm -hmm. pull them off and just kind of watch it for a day or two to see if, if it continues on. I, I think that's good, and if it's a disease, mm -hmm. do not want to compost those leaves. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's got a lot, you know, it's not, it's not powdery mildew yet, but um, okay. that's the same kind of thing. You don't want to compost powdery mildew. And I know we may address that question later. Um, yeah. I, I want one caution about uh, fish emulsion. Every time I've used it, uh, I've invited raccoons in and skunks. They just think oh. a fish is buried there and they dig it up. So, huh. uh, but I, the idea of a dilute solution, that's basically a nitrogen uh, addition, isn't it, Sandy? It is. It's primarily that, although it has some of the other uh, P and K in it as well. Um, and as I say, I dilute it, and I'm urban enough, and you may have raccoons and skunks in Wisconsin, but I'm feeling urban enough. Uh, mostly what I have to deal with are bunnies. Oh, Sandy, you've got raccoons and possums in your backyard. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm you sure really I don't know. know. I just want to see park. them. You're asleep. You want to see them. Yeah, urban fauna. Uh, <laughs> The one thing that you did touch on, Sandy, and I just want to maybe emphasize a little bit is a soil test. Mm -hmm. um, you should be doing a soil test every three years or so at the end of the growing season. That will tell you what nutrients are still in the soil before uh, you start adding. I mean, the, the part of the goal of a soil test is to put the right nutrients in as well as telling you what the organic matter percentage is. Optimum 5% almost nobody can get up there. You can get to three and a half percent, you're doing great. But that's one of those gardening secrets or tips, mm -hmm. adding uh, uh, organic mm -hmm. matter to your soil every year, best done in the fall. So it okay, really that's great. So compost in the fall. Yeah, mm -hmm. things, uh, kitchen waste, um, anything that's organic and, and not polluted by a chemical, uh, you can put in your garden in the fall and it won't be there in the spring. Okay. And the yeah, it's sometimes it's called sheet composting. Okay. Uh, you've taken up your tomato plants and your pepper plants and things, and uh, just I just lay that down out of my compost bin. And Don's right, it's gone by spring. Wow. It's just absorbed into the soil. Okay, I'm going to keep us going because I want to try to get to all the questions that I see here. Um, let's see, uh, from 
Laura, I have two summer squash plants that are now growing and producing beautifully, but they're starting to take over the garden. I've already had to transplant two other plants. Can I prune them? Sure. Summer yeah. squash? Mm -hmm. Typically, if they're vining, yeah, you can prune them. If, if they're vining, if you prune off the leader, uh, it's not going to continue to produce. Right. Uh, if it's a bush plant, you can. Uh, and I just want to mention the name of a beautiful summer squash, Cocozelle. C-O-C-O-Z-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. It's a tasty summer squash that's striped and easy to find and beautiful. Uh, and as you all know, you want to pick those squash young, like four inches or so. Before yeah. they turn into baseball bats. Nice. Right. Right. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> hey, Ellen. <laughs> um, okay, great. Um, I hope that got to her question. Okay, I'm going to keep scrolling through. Um, we cut down our backyard. Oh, Becky. Hi, Becky. We cut down our backyard cherry tree last year and now have pretty much all sun in the yard. I have multiple flower pots and wondering what would be best to put them in to tolerate heat and summer all and sun all summer long. Most of what I planted this year was wilted from the heat and sun. So what are some nice sun loving plants that you guys would recommend? Is she wanting to do perennials or annuals? Let's suggest some perennials, and then Becky, you can chime in. Problem with perennials in pots is that they don't always winter over very well, um, and a lot of people do them. Again, uh, my own feeling is I tend to put annuals, I'm, I'm not a big pot person, and Ellen Kuhner, who's on this call, is, does really wonderful things with pots. But I think for color, uh, and you want some flowers for summer, uh, verbena are beautiful. They trail over the sides of a pot. Uh, I'm a big fan of marigolds. I don't know that they chase away tomato bugs, but um, they provide just a lot of beautiful color. Uh, if she wants uh, to use perennials, uh, coneflowers are marvelous because they, uh, they feed the butterflies, they hold their flowers all summer. Uh, they can, if, depending on the kind of pot, they can stay outside all winter and provide uh, food for the birds. Okay, yeah, she's looking for annuals. So good that you mentioned that. Anybody else have some suggestions for Becky yeah. about annuals, Patty? So um, annuals, I mean, it, if she's looking to do something yet this year, um, you know, it's a little late. You know, most of the garden centers have, you know, emptied out from their summer annual sales and whatnot. Um, but believe it or not, we're getting pretty close to fall. So, you know, your fall asters, your fall mums, um, really any of your fall annuals because the nights are cool enough that, um, you know, they'll be able to take that heat during the day. So um, we're, we're getting close there that um, you, you'll start seeing some fall annuals out in the market. Okay. And the, the uh, uh, chrysanthemums that you'll see that are already starting to bloom, you need to treat those as annuals because if you try to plant them in the ground afterward, they're, they're, bred and raised so that they will be blooming in the early fall and they generally won't make it through the winter. So put them in a pot and treat them as annuals. Okay. Yeah, and one other thing about um, the mums, we are growing, um, we're going to be having a mum sale um, this fall at the conservatory. We're growing both the perennial mums and the annual mums as well as like a host of asters and that. So um, you could do either in a pot. Okay, that sounds great. I'm going to keep us moving along just because I want to be cognizant of our time together. And we um, have a lot of questions still. My, um, let's see, my plants are suffering yellow and not really fruiting. Can I use Osmocote? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what that is. It's fertilizer. Is slow release fertilizer, such that you put it in the soil and over months, uh, the covering dissolves and feeds the plants. Now is not really the time to, to, uh, to put it in. You actually put it in around planting time. If you wanted okay. to feed right now, you'd either use a leaf a foliar uh, fertilizer or a side dress with, uh, uh, um, you know, the best is an organic fertilizer, of course, that, that is more respectful of the soil and the life of the soil. Um, but you could also use a, uh, a dissolving chemical that would uh, give the plants a boost. It's not a good idea, actually, to fertilize in the heat. Uh, the yes. Really mm -hmm. don't. Um, so mm -hmm. if your plants are yellowing, it means that your garden soil probably needs some amendment uh, before you start your next year's season. And the time to do that is, is this fall. 
um, to get ready for next year. Again, a soil test would be a really good idea. Uh, um, the Cook County Farm Bureau is one place where you can get a soil test. You call them up, you give them uh, the payment, they mail you a kit, you take uh, and instructions how to do it, you mail it back and then you get the report. It all happens in a timely fashion. And again, you should be doing it at the end of the year and every three years. That's great. I really love that suggestion. Um, the I, tomatoes, one quick thing about yeah. uh, things setting fruit. Tomatoes do not like to set fruit in the heat and it, they, may, they may bloom, they may not even bloom, but they may not set fruit because we've had a number of successive days where it's gotten to be 90 or above. And that can, uh, that can affect how your, how, how, how your tomatoes set fruit. Oh, I hope not. I hope I get some. Mine are. <laughs> Hopefully we can get we can get a good turnout. Um, let's see. We have um, it's Dennis, but I think I saw um, Dennis Kimmick, but I think I saw um, Mrs. Kimmick on. Um, how can I treat mildew on flocks? We did talk about squash and cucumbers. So is there a treatment? We did we kind of touched on this. If it gets to the point where it's that um, powdery mildew, is there a treatment? I've, I've suffered from it with my zucchini squash, but I don't know how to treat it. Right. The best thing is cleanliness and planting varieties that are mildew resistant. Okay. Um, once you have it, um, it, it is very hard to get rid of. So in the fall, you just want to make sure you're cleaning up all of those leaves um, even at the base of it um, and not leaving them to overwinter. Um, but the number one recommendation for mildew is just in the future to look for, especially with flocks, um, there's mildew resistant varieties. Okay. The, the, other thing you can, the other thing you can do with flocks is when they start to come up in the spring, yeah. thin them at the base so okay. that they're not, they're not a lot of stems close together. So you have better air circulation, which also can help keep the powdery mildew down. Okay. And just it's, to, go ahead, Dan. Um, just to add, there are certain plants that are just given to, to powdery mildew, and, and that's the cucurbits, uh, the zinnias, uh, phlox, as you've seen, uh, roses can get it. Uh, yeah. so, so Lilacs. Lilacs, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, more air moving through, um, and uh, there are chemicals to use, but you don't want to really do that. It, uh, it, it just it harms you, it harms the soil, it harms your kids and the pets and all that. So, um, a, a good, good garden practice rather than uh, a chemical added. Yeah, I love that. I love this idea of thinning um, so that there's enough air circulation and you'll still get that kind of clumping, um, beautiful, you know, um, look, but you can just thin it out a little bit because it'll fill in when it starts to flower. So I, I think that that's a great tip. And then again, just to echo Patty, you want to look for um, powdery mildew resistant varieties. Yeah. Okay, um, my Shasta daisies bloomed well for two years. I split them and that year noted rust, which seemed to kill off the daisy plant. How can I avoid losing these plants? I found some rust spots on some of my um, penstenum this year too. What, what, is, um, what is your advice for, this is Shasta daisies and they were split and then went downhill. Hmm. Patty? Oh, I've uh, never, I've never seen it. I, I have, um, if it's an older variety of Shasta, I see it more. The newer varieties, I don't see it as much. Um, this, so if it grows and it's just not blooming, um, you know, I don't have a lot of recommendations for that. It's one of those, you know, uh, things with older plants, and that's why plant breeders are, are consistently trying to improve. Like, for instance, we were talking powdery mildew, um, plant breeders that are, are really heavily into flocks. That's one thing they, um, they breed for. Um, so there are some newer varieties of Shasta that are more resistant to that. Um, but as far as a remedy, I don't have anything off the top of my head. Just well, basic... Basic plant health can often keep diseases at bay or make them so that they don't make a lot of, they don't cause a lot of damage. Uh, again, you might uh, give these guys some compost going into the, going now and going into the winter to strengthen them and see if they bloom again next year. Real quickly, okay, great. 
I'm going to keep us. Rust looks like gross. Um, um, oh, now the name just went out of it. What's the alley plant? The garage plant. My grandmother always grew it tall. Um, Day lilies. I mean, ditch lilies. No, no. I'll hollyhocks. Hollyhocks. Mm -hmm. Hollyhocks will just attract rust like crazy. The whole leaf uh, will turn orange and just be riddled with uh, that disease. So a lot of people don't grow it for that reason. But actually, it's too bad because hollyhocks, especially in the double version. It's a beautiful plant, uh, tall, mm -hmm. uh, lots of wonderful flowers, and they easily, easily receive themselves, although they are a biennial. If you have no exposures to biennials, there's a good example of one. Uh, you get the vegetative growth low to the ground in a whorl in the first year, and then you get the wonderful spike that can go four to six feet, even eight feet if you pour it fertilizer like crazy on it. Nice plant. So um, there's a question about what to plant now to add color to the garden. And I think we talked about some mounds and were there any other um, ideas to add for um, planting? Yeah, and this summer is a great time. Um, we propagated sunflowers and cithonia. Um, and, you know, right now we're entering sunflower season. Um, you know, there's some great um, fields uh, more kind of south of us where there's fields of sunflowers starting to bloom. A lot of photographers flock to those places uh, to take pictures. So, um, you know, if you can find them, now is too late to start them from seed. Uh, but I think like the garden centers have started catching on and kind of like we do at the conservatory, we have sowed about a month ago sunflowers and now they're going to be blooming pretty soon. Um, so those are good. Um, you know, perennials, I, you know, are, are great. And I am one that plants my, I plant perennials in containers. I use a lot of perennials mixed with annuals. So um, any late kind of blooming um, perennials you can add. And there's so many great ones, a lot of coneflowers. Coneflowers, asters right now, and just yeah. all the different shades of blue and white and solidago which is yeah. just, there's, there's one whose name I can't remember that I have in my parkway that looks just like a shower of, um, of, of lightning. It's, be it's just beautiful. And we want to have things blooming late into the season because there are pollinators and other critters still around who are trying to survive or get ready for winter. So it's good to have things that, that, that was a good question, to have the things that bloom all season long and that our succession will, you know, one's finished and then the next one starts. As you look around in the neighborhoods, uh, Woodbeckia, Black-Eyed Susans are blooming like crazy right now. Mm -hmm. uh, a plant you might want to consider is milkweed. Um, they're mm. very, very easy to start from seed. On a, you, you, you put the seeds in a plastic bag with a damp paper towel for two months, and at the end of two months, they're all sprouted. And you just put them in, in plant cells, and they're very easy to grow. And of course, uh, this year, at least from my impression, there's been an awful lot of monarch butterflies around. Uh, mm -hmm. much, mm -hmm. much more than we've seen in years. And I think it's because people are pl uh, planting on. common milkweed, not, not some of the cultivars, but the common milkweed. Yeah. Um, and, and Russian sage is a large, oh, that's uh, pretty too. beautiful that's plant pretty. For, the, for the fall. Okay, so um, just to kind of fit in these other questions, we've got some edible questions coming up here. So lettuce is bolted. What's a good replacement plant for the area in my garden right now? And then there's a question about kale that has little holes in it, kind of Swiss cheese. Wondering if it's aphids. Uh, real quickly about lettuce. Uh, this is a trick I just love to do. You can plant lettuce right now. Okay. It's classically a cool weather crop, but if you plant it very shallow and put a cover over it of either straw or even a shade covering like cheesecloth, it will, uh, it will grow. Um, and you wanna try to grow leaf lettuce, of course, Head lettuce is, is uh, a tougher plant to grow, but it will grow. And uh, uh, I, I encourage the uh, lettuces that are dark leaves that have red leaves. The, the darker the leaf, the, the more nutritious it is. Um, and, the, uh, and radishes now are, are, you know, you can start radishes very easily. I tend to get flea beetles on my radishes, and they're sort of an attractant to insects. That's one trick you can do in a garden is plant a crop that the insects go to, and they leave the other things alone. Uh, which is kind of neat. And uh, well, we haven't covered this in terms of edibles, but uh, it's a good time now to consider starting uh, fall cool weather crops like yeah. broccoli or kale. And if okay. someone's biting your kale, I bite it right back. And peas. Uh, 
my peas, believe it or not, are still producing. I have a row of, of snow peas. Yes. Usually they're dried up and gone by now, but they've made it. And so as soon as I pull them up, I'll wait probably a couple of weeks until it cools off a little bit, and then I'm going to plant another row. And it's always a, a, a race to see if, if they come up and do well before a really hard frost. But we like peas in our family, so. Yeah, if you haven't yes. peas or beans before, uh, you might need a soil inoculant. Mm -hmm. plant, leguminous plants that fix nitrogen from nodules on the roots, and they need a, uh, an enzyme for that to happen. And so this is a sprinkle dust that you put into the soil and it helps the peas and beans do what they do. Once you've got a, a one crop, it's already in the soil. You don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the bunny rabbits love the legumes, and so you need a, about a two-foot-tall fence to protect them, or you probably chain David out there at night, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, but what I have done that has really worked well, um, the peas are on usually on one side of, of uh, one of my raised beds, and so the, the pea fence is on that edge. And then what I have done is taken the, um, the white, um, I don't know what they call it, it's, it's, it's spun fabric basically. And I've pegged it down on the, uh, for about two inches out and then brought it up to the top of the fence and clipped it. And it's kept the rabbits out of those peas until they've gotten to be two or three or four inches tall and they're less interesting when they're older and tougher, and then I take the stuff off, and that has worked. Hmm. But the only thing that really keeps rabbits out is fence. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, what about the kale holes? I get them as well, and I always see these little white moths flying around. Uh, I'm wondering what is causing the holes, and somebody's wondering, Laura is wondering, is it aphids? But I'm wondering oh. if it's something else, because I don't think aphids like my kale. It's a caterpillar. It's a Daddy. caterpillar. It's a classic white cabbage butterfly yeah. that lays its eggs on any of the coal family plants. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they're chewing, the, when, they, when they hatch, the eggs hatch. They have little green caterpillars about a half an inch long. Okay. And uh, the, there's a chemical you can use called Seven, S-E-V-I-N, carbarils, it's real chemical name. It's good to use it if only because you can use it right up, almost up until harvest. If you give yourself a buffer of three days before you harvest, uh, you can use it. The other thing is a lot of people don't want to use it. Uh, if you just soak your plant in salty water before you use it, the salty water will knock those green worms off. I uh -huh. asked an Amish lady what they do. An Amish are wonderful organic gardeners. They put their laundry water on uh, all of their, their coal family plants. What? They never have any problems and the plants are clean. Wow. Okay, good to know. I, I try to just um, trim off the ones that are, you know, super ho holy, but I, I still have enough leaves yeah. to, to, you they'll know. Devastate your, yeah, they'll devastate your cabbage and your kale. So, okay. so it's not something to ignore. Okay. I have grown Swiss chard in the past, and I found that I was getting little holes in my chard leaves, and I couldn't figure out what in the world it was. There were no critters. I looked and looked and looked until I saw a flash of yellow. And there was a little yellow bird that was lighting on my on my uh, Swiss chard and mm -hmm. eating holes in my in my Swiss chard. Healthy bird. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. apparently. Yeah. So we I, have um, we have a bunch uh, a few more questions. So let's see if we can address these, and then I'll open it up for people to say hi um, verbally. Um, okay, the famous. Um, Patty, the Magellan Gorilla Perilla Sandy, we sold this mm -hmm. at the plant sale. Articles I've read, is it poisonous? I've read no. it go both ways. I purchased it through um, the plant sale from the conservatory, but can't get an answer. So it's we not, just, yeah, no, it's not so. poisonous. No. It has a square stem. It's in the mint family. Yes. The uh, Japanese people use those leaves to give color to the... Um, ginger that we find with Japanese food, and uh, it's, it's fine. Patty? Yes. <laughs> Agreed. All right, um, great, thank you. Um, my pepper plants don't have any peppers yet. Is there any chance that they'll produce? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, patience. Sometimes when people uh, use too high a nitrogen fertilizer on yeah. pepper plants, it's mm -hmm. a lot of vegetative growth, but not much, uh, not enough um, 
of uh, fruit. Uh, it's got to have a lot of sun. That's a sun-loving plant. It is also a plant that is a heat-loving plant, and many people put that plant out way too early in the start of the growing season, and that stunts it for back at least two weeks. So it could be your plant is slowed down because of having gotten out too soon. Uh, and um, with peppers, sometimes you have to put a cage around them because if they have a lot of fruit, they will get very heavy and start breaking off. And that breaking problem comes from trying to pick them too. This is a plant when you harvest, it's best to use shears to cut the peppers off rather than trying to grab them because inevitably you'll break stems off. Um, and I would encourage you to look at other than uh, the uh, green bell pepper. I mean, that's a beautiful pepper to grow, but uh, there's lots of different shapes with flavors. And, uh, and some of the spicier ones, there's even mild spicy uh, jalapeno and habanero that add more flavor to your cooking. You don't need to get high, uh, what is it, capsaicin, I think is the chemical mm -hmm. that wants to hurt you. Um, I actually uh, was given one at the uh, Museum of Science and Industry Smart Home Garden to taste, and it took me a half an hour with a hose in my mouth <laughs> the true story. Yeah. You a little yellow pepper that kills you. <laughs> the hot, you're, you're not a hothead, are you? No. The 51010 fertilizer is, and John, uh, Don, you might want to chime in too. Uh, that's typically what I use for peppers because it has half as much nitrogen. What, what is I mean, it? you need some nitrogen for some good sturdy stems, but that phosphorus is really going to help with the, uh, the fruit production. But, you know, um, we just don't live in an area anymore where we get that early heat, really hot summer, and it stays with us. Um, you know, Arizona, they, in their springtime, they can grow peppers um, because they have that heat all day. Uh, but, yeah, um, and, and nutrient-rich soil, too. Yeah, I saw a pepper plant, uh, at least on, on uh, uh, the internet today, from a friend of mine who was, grows it in his backyard uh, in a microclimate. So it's in a pot, a very large pot, but that must have had 25, 30 peppers on wow. it. Wow. Wow, wow. It's in a Yum. concrete uh, pad against the garage. The heat is playing on it all the time. Yeah. The pepper was, you could almost hear it laughing. It was so happy. <laughs> that's, what you, that's what you need to do with that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to, um, there's one last question, but it's taking us indoors. And then I'm going to wrap up and um, just mention some of our upcoming programs for you all. Um, so this is an interesting question about some indoor plants. I have a pitcher plant, but it, it seems to be doing well, but the main stem is turning black. What can mm -hmm. I do about this? I also have two bonsais and they're both getting yellow. Is it just too much exposure to light? So anybody good with um, the pitcher plant black stem or the um, bonsai that is um, turning yellow? So the pitcher plant, I don't know if they transplanted it recently, but that could be one reason. They get quite angry when they get transplanted. Um, and then you want to make sure that you're not using tap water to water it. Um, you know, either a distilled or a rainwater is good for pitcher plants. But I would say, you know, and we propagate a lot of carnivorous plants, um, generally more in the early spring. And that's the number one reason we see black stem or black on them is because of transplanting or some type of disturbance mm -hmm. with it. Okay, and then bonsai is turning yellow. I'm not a bonsai expert. I know that they need more of a consistent watering. Um, so I'm going to defer that question if Sandy or, or Don I, know I more about that. Chicago bonsai. Botanic Garden has a bonsai uh, organization and a wonderful show in the fall. If you haven't yeah. gone to it, this mm -hmm. summer, it's just fabulous. Uh, so are all the rest of their shows, their Dahlia show, uh, their orchid show. It's really worth uh, the trouble of getting a membership and going up there and seeing those uh, once things open up again, of course. So I, my guess would be it is a nutrient problem. But boy, with bonsai, you're, you're really messing with a, a life form and trying to contort it at the same time you're trying to not make it grow too fast. Uh, I, I really don't know myself. Okay, that's great. Um, let me um, just wrap us up for a second and then I'll open it up for um, questions to everybody. Um, Speaking of um, the, I think you mentioned something about getting a membership, um, but I just wanted to say that 
if you become a member of the Friends of the Oak Park Conservatory, one of the benefits of joining the Friends is that you get free admission. Um, it's a reciprocal garden program to over 300 gardens nationwide. And the Chicago Botanic Garden is actually included in our reciprocal program. So what that means is that when you go up there, you get in for free and do not have to pay for parking. That's $25 of savings. So I just want to put a plug in for um, joining. Um, we also offer 10% um, discount at some of our partner gardens, um, Clover's, Good Earth, McAdam, Westgate Flowers. So um, you can take advantage of these two benefits right away. And then we also have additional um, member benefits you can find out about on our website. Um, if you're interested, um, maybe not in bonsai, but in succulents, um, right around the corner, we have this fantastic lecture coming up on July 30th. Um, I'm very delighted um, to have Kent Gentry from the conservatory as our speaker, and Ken Boyer will be his co-host, and he's one of our longtime volunteers that works with Kent on succulents, and um, that will be the kickoff to the conservatory's um, succulent sale, which I'm very excited about. My college daughter will be going um, to school with some succulents. Um, and then for all of us who are new to veggie gardening or have an abundance of garden vegetables that we don't know what to do with, um, we are very excited to have a local cookbook author and food blogger. Um, she also is founder of the Chicago Food Swap. Emily Pastor will be joining us on August 5th um, to share with us five different ways to preserve your harvest. So um, for those of you that are interested in getting some um, tips, um, that's great. And for the little ones, um, we have a fantastic new program we kicked off in the Discovery Garden um, this summer. It is um, socially distanced and um, a, a really outdoor um, storytelling um, experience with singing and puppets, et cetera. And so, um, so those are just some upcoming programs and I'm gonna have everybody um, unmute yourself if you'd like. Um, and come say hi to us. Um, and uh, any other questions you're um, able to squeeze in um, before we wrap up, but we're just- Judy, can I squeeze in yeah. something? That, yeah, uh, You mentioned the Botanic Garden. We are blessed with a number of really wonderful resources in the area. Yeah. The Botanic Garden is one. The Morton Arboretum is amazing if you're into shrubs and trees. If you don't know what you want to plant, go look and you can see them uh, in and sight and see what the plants look like. Uh, another one that I really want to plug, the Missouri Botanical Garden mm -hmm. has uh, something called Plant Finder on their website. Mm -hmm. And it is the most useful, uh, accurate, up-to-date um, information about plants that I have found anywhere, in addition to the University of Illinois Extensions. But the Missouri Botanic Garden, it has a sheet for or a page for each plant and uh, they really do keep track of, keep up with things, keep up with changes in botanical names and all that sort of thing. And it's really, it's really useful information about plants. Great. Okay, well, we're opening it up uh, for a couple more minutes here. If you have a burning question about gardening or want to say hi to our pan panelists or me. <laughs> or me. <laughs> um, I just learned, I took a full page of notes. I just learned so much and, mm -hmm. um, and this whole, I love the cover crop of the buckwheat. Um, I just pulled our garlic from our congregation garden um, in the last week or two, and the bulbs were like almost the size of tomatoes. They were humongous. <laughs> and I've got them on the front porch um, curing right now. So um, I'm, I'm delivering some um, tomorrow to our um, clergy <laughs> because why not? It's pandemic. They deserve some garlic, fresh garlic. <laughs> Chime in. I, I, I think uh, a resource we haven't mentioned is all the people who are uh, signed in or participating quietly up to this point, I hope from this, this point forward talking. But um, I sometimes think, you know, we're sage on the stage and all that stuff. Um, I know that, that you guys know so much about gardening and that if we really were able to have a round robin discussion, we would all learn from each other uh, rather than uh, uh, the Sandy Show, let me just put it that way. <laughs> it's, the, it's the Don and Sandy Show. And the other place is the Oak Park Area Garden Club, which is a spinoff yeah. of the Oak Park mm -hmm. River Forest Garden Club. And it's a Facebook page. And so often people say, what about this? And what about that? And somebody will chime in with 
the answer or a suggestion or you know the obscure botanical name for things or whatever and it's been it's really been fun to be on that uh, on that site and to share information it, it's excellent i i agree i overshare on that page so anybody want to say hi any of our um participants any other questions we didn't cover I mean, this was, this was a dream to get these three together. And um, we've got Ellen, who's also a master gardener and on our board. And I know Sue um, Boyer is on this. And I see Je Jeff or Stephanie, um, other board members. Um, you know, we're, Hey, we're, Judy. Did, yeah, there you are. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I feel reluctant to, to say anything being the rookie here uh, in the vegetable <laughs> garden. That's the only <laughs> way you learn. The, the talk true. of... The talk about the cabbage butterfly is absolutely true. Um, uh, our partner would not consider any kind of chemical uh, to get rid of it, but we found a garlic spray where oh. you actually chop up garlic and soak it in mineral oil. Okay. Ew. And then <laughs> use that uh, in, as, as a concentrate uh, mixed with dish soap and you dilute it. And we, we, we did defeat the cabbage worms this year. Okay. Um, hmm. You just have to spray them. You know, um, I, I've so done this other, um, it was like the trick of the eye um, that I read about last year when I was battling these white moths. If you put something white in your garden, it makes it look like there's a um, white something already there and it, it makes oh. the butterflies go oh. away. Oh. So I tried that last oh, year, but yeah. I, moved, yeah. I moved my beds this year and I, um, I didn't do it. So I love this. I love that we can, mm -hmm. you know, kind of share. Um, anybody else want to say hi or chime in? I have a question. Yeah. I, do. I, have, I have so many chameleon plants. I'm sorry oh. that I ever put this into my backyard <laughs> and i'm wondering how deep you have to go to get rid of it because China. it's taken over pacassandra it's uh, oh. <laughs> any ideas i have it too and i thought they were gorgeous and i fortunately it's in a patch of my side yard where uh there are a lot of um, lilies of the valley and violets and I've sort of let them all duke it out it's an area that's very even though it's on the south side of the house it's very shady and I go after them when they start to come out from there with my handy dandy little dandelion digger ah. but, but you've got to get you've just got to get down and get the roots and keep after them because uh, the doggone things are uh, among the few plants that I deem spawn of Satan. And if anybody knows what to do about bindweed, um, I have the same problem. I've got it uh, on my fence. It's in my neighbor's yard. And uh, it's just, you just have to keep after it. Yeah. That's like yeah. creeping there, Charlie. There's some um, plants that, you know, um, you, you've got to decide how long you want to fight that battle with. Um, bindweed is one, um, Canadian thistle is one that um, I will go to um, a chemical product called Garlon um, mm. and use that. Uh, but I have been combating bindweed since we bought our home um, 10 years ago. And Thank you for the encouragement, Patty. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very tough to get rid of. Um, chameleon plant is actually an invasive plant, so you do want to you know, don't plant that. Don't give it to any neighbors. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's very, very difficult to get rid of. And the other thing that I'm finding invasive that never seemed to used to have been, if that's such a phrase, is the autumn flowering clematis. I had it for years on my garage. It blooms in the fall. It has sweet little white flowers. It's wonderful. I'm finding it now everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. And so I pulled it up. My neighbor pulled hers up, and I must have gotten 10 plants out of my perennial border this morning. Yeah, that's listed, awful. As a, listed as an aggressive, invasive. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. The birds take it off, and uh, it can't take over. A you know what you'll see? it Drive through the countryside in the fall, and you'll see just swales of that plant. Yeah. In the trees, too. Mm -hmm. Too bad. 
Okay, anybody else want to chime in? We, we've got a couple, couple more minutes and then we're going to, okay, yeah, go ahead. Um, I'd like to try planting garlic. Do I have to buy a special kind? Mm -hmm. um, there's hard neck garlic and soft neck garlic and California garlic. You don't want the California. Um, the hard neck garlic is the one that they put into uh, ropes and save against vampires. And the soft neck <laughs> garlic is the one we normally use. Um, and uh, generally you plant it in uh, later in the summer or even early in the fall. It's an allium family plant. So it's got a pretty uh, fleshy root system that does not like to compete with weeds. So what I like to do is create these drills or hills. In other words, a long elevated row into which I put uh, each clove of garlic about two inches deep and about six inches apart. And then I mulch the heck out of it. So it's disappeared mm -hmm. in the fall, but all that time, the roots are growing like crazy. It'll be the first plant to come up in springtime, and because you mulched it, uh, it won't come up too quick to get hurt. Nothing. It, it, the, the onion plants really don't mind cold, um, and uh, it grows pretty aggressively through the summertime. You'll get scapes, which looks like a, a, a swan head or neck, and that you can cut those off, and they, they're wonderful to cook with. And then as the foliage begins to die back, uh, is when you pull the plants and as uh, was described by, I think it was uh, Patty talked about, or whoever it was, uh, pull the garlic up and, uh, uh, oh, that's right, it was, it was uh, Me. wonderful. Me, it was Judy. Executive director, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, you have to be careful about how you treat it once you pull it. Uh, you don't want to get it wet and you do want to cure it um, and it will stay, we usually finished eating it in January. Uh, we had enough to do that. And, and if you grow enough garlic, you can roast it um, or give it away, fresh garlic. There are lots of varieties available. Uh, don't, uh, you go for some of the odd ones like porcelain or uh, enchelium or uh, German red. Uh, they, they have wonderful uh, flavors, much different from what you'll get at the grocery store. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful plant to go grow. And it's a thing you do in the late, late growing season even into the cool season when you would normally be planting spring bulbs, uh, <laughs> planting garlic. Places and to get those I, bulbs, uh, Johnny's uh, seed house is one, catalog house is one of them. Yeah. Um, uh, Shapers um, select seeds. There's a number of, of good quality catalog houses that carry them. You don't want to buy your, buy the, your seed garlic from the grocery store. No. Although oh. I will say I got mine from the sugar beet um, the last two years and it has been excellent in producing and um, they, it is the seed garlic. So um, mm -hmm. I have two different varieties um, that has been fantastic. So sugar beet knows what they're doing. I would trust yeah. getting it from there if you wanted to go um, locally and try, test it out. But mm -hmm. um, we couldn't plant enough. And I had the second graders plant it this year and uh, it's just in the summertime, nobody's around. So um, I harvest it and then figure out what to do with it. And if there's too much, it'll go to the food pantry. But it is, it is a treasure in our garden for sure. And you can do what I do and save the, your best bulb. I grow the hardneck because I like the scapes. And I save my best bulb. And then that becomes my seed garlic for the following year. Really? How do you yeah. save it then? How do you save it? I just it don't eat it. We just don't eat okay, it. Okay, I gotcha. Okay. Ah, and oh, then it's be hard not to eat it. <laughs> well, I have it. I get it. I think there's Don was talking about 40 plants or whatever. And uh, again, small garden. I have probably a dozen or so now that are curing on my back porch. Okay. And I'll just look them over and save the best one and not put it in my garlic container. I'll okay. go downstairs with the, with the plants. And uh, that's that's what I'll use for my seed. I mean, that's what our ancestors did. They saved their seed, their best seed for yeah. the crop for the following year because they didn't yeah. have the uh, the advantages of the seed companies and such that we do now.